The UFC is headed to Macau, China for the first time in 10 years. They brought a couple of former world champions with them for the main event and a whole bunch of the road to the UFC tournament finalists to round out this card. My name is Angelo. This is We Want Picks. And I'm going to break down the entire UFC China fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and bets. Before we look forward, let's take a minute and look back. Last night was UFC 309. Overall, it was a pretty straightforward card. Very uneventful, but John Jones did what John Jones does. He dominated in a title fight. It also turns out that all of the I'm not going to fight Tom Aspinall stuff was just a public negotiation to get more money. He was actually pretty clear about that in his post-fight speech. If you want more info, insight, and a full recap of that card, here's the thumbnail with the Home Alone face. I walk you through every single fight and my thoughts on those. Here's a look at the bets from last night. It was another successful night. The streak that I'm on right now is an all-time heater. I am up 11 of the last 12 cards. It actually is defying logic. I went into this card being like, what goes up must come down. I can't win forever. And then here we are. It's one of my better nights on the year. A 41% ROI. Two full units of net profit. Listen, I only put five units out the door and I brought back seven. It's easy to get two units profit when you bet 197 units. 41% ROI. ROI, as we mentioned, is the most important number when assessing bets. The only bets I missed was a Damon Jackson money line when he was only minus 115. And then a Basel Hafez underdog bet and if you look at the scorecards he was going to win that fight if he didn't get clipped but it wasn't just last night and it wasn't just the safety parlay the safety parlay is on quite a little streak here i have won seven safety parlays in a row four of those seven were plus money and i hate bragging about the safety parlay because eventually it will lose and we've had plenty of nights where the safety parlay lost and all the other bets did well and people still lost their minds because everybody gets obsessed with the safety parlay. But I am, I am going to spend a minute and brag and let's hope we don't jinx it. I've hit seven in a row. Four of them were plus money. A 92% ROI from one single bet, 6.45 net units. Here's a closer look at the last 12 cards. The only card I didn't make money on in the last 12 fight cards is UFC pairs. If you became a premium member at any point in this stretch, you are up big time money. Your premium paid for itself 10 times over. You made a whole bunch of real money. And I'm just glad I could do this, honestly. I'm just thankful that I am on this heater. I don't know how. I don't know why. I don't know what I've done. But this has been a phenomenal year. These last 12 weeks have been even better than the first chunk of the year. And we're going to continue to ride this success through the rest of this year. If you want to become a premium member, it's freaking $10. $10. Ten there are people out there charging $100 that get smoked every week. There's people charging $30 per car. It's a, it's a joke. $10 a month. All the picks, the bets, the round line leans, the artificial intelligence, every single freaking thing that we do. Just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. Again, $10. You're going to get UFC 310, UFC Tampa, UFC China for that 10 bucks. We also had the best DraftKings ownership projections on the planet. I saw some chirping, some nerd chirping recently that there's somebody else saying that they have the best ownership projections. Well, they're wrong. Here's... The stats. Here's the data. Anybody out there says that they have the best DraftKings ownership projections, they're either a liar or clueless. If you look at this chart, that column that says actual, those were the actual ownership numbers from UFC 309. And if you work down each column to the right, those are the different competitors in this space. And those competitors aren't like Jimmy John's dickhead Patreon. And not the sandwich guy. It's a different Jimmy John. Those are giant DFS companies. And the only thing they do is try to put out important numbers like this and they have millions of dollars backing them in their companies and they cannot compete with us. We are the far right column, 3.08% margin of error, smoked everybody in this space. The ownership projections are included in the package. We don't have tiers, we don't have nonsense. Every single freaking thing we do, all the bets, all the picks, everything, $10 a month. You're gonna get tools like the data analyzer. I know a massive chunk of you like to do your own research and good for you, I love it. I would actually prefer, if I could pick, my preference would be you guys do your own research and your own bets and you don't tail mine. But you are tailing mine and we're crushing it, so it is what it is. And we have well over now at this point. We're at like 4,200 premium members. And a lot of that has to do with the bets hitting. But if you do want the tools, 
We have data analyzer. We built this tool from scratch, coded it from scratch. It has interactive data, stackable filters. And then it updates a plot line chart at the bottom and each dot is a fight of that fighter's career. You click the button, boom, video pops up. You can watch the fight. You're also gonna get the DraftKings Optimizer. This is preloaded with those ownership projections I mentioned before. You're gonna get the line movement tracker. This will give you opening odds, current odds, win probability, and line movement for every fighter on every card. You're gonna get the Prop Hunter, a curated set of data specifically designed to help you find prop bets. And you're gonna get a guy from New Zealand and a robot giving you picks, bets, and breakdowns. The New Zealand guy, Artem Baby, is going to give you picks, bets, and breakdowns for more than just UFC. And once we hit this couple of week break between the end of this year and the beginning of next year, the UFC takes some time off, but nobody else does. Artem will have those picks and bets for those fight cards. Artificial intelligence breaking down fights solely off historical data. All this crap. $10 an entire month. One single package. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. We have one UFC left this year, one pay per view. Every single pay-per-view, we film a vlog. Yesterday for UFC 309, I filmed a vlog. I opened a couple of letters. I read the mail. I did all those things. If you want to send something, you want to promote your small business or large business, frankly, you want to write a letter, you want to do anything like that, we want picks. P.O. Box 406 in Prosper, Texas, 75078. Let's go ahead and break down this card. Guys, I'm, I'm going to need some grace from you. I'm going to need some grace from you. I filmed the UFC 309 recap video immediately after that aired. So I was sitting in this chair till 2 o'clock in the morning. Then I had to chop the video up, do a thumbnail, upload it, chapters, all that. Then I had to lay down and wind down. It is very hard to wind down after filming a video like this. People going furious with the comments. Furious in a good way, like very fast and aggressive like, like Vin Diesel in the comments. I made money. Thank you so much. So then I'm all excited for you guys. I didn't fall asleep till about three. It is a little past seven right now. And the biggest thing is you don't need as much sleep as you think you do. Nobody does. You do not need that much sleep. My issue is going to be my eyes. I wear contacts. They dry out. And I'm going to be blinking like I have a tick. I do not. So I'm going to need some forgiveness here with the dry eyes, the blinking, and probably a whole bunch of jump cuts. Opening up the UFC China. Fight card, we have a Mahashete taking on Nicholas Mata. Mahashete is still a really young guy. We've seen the name. He's been in the UFC for a little while now, but he's still only 24. He's got a ton of experience. He's a fun striker. He can hang in a firefight or dance around the outside and be technical about it. He mixes in traditional martial arts techniques. He's got side kicks, flashy kicks, spinning attacks, even nice elbows inside the pocket. If you let him dictate the pace, you could have a pretty long night. But if you stay in his face... You back him up, you can have success getting to his chin or grinding him to the ground. He's coming off that close win over Gabriel Benitez where he was very hittable, but he did basically win that fight by taking some shots and then landing bigger ones. He's taking on Nicholas Mata. Nicholas Mata is a pretty good striker. He's explosive, he's athletic, he moves well, he's got speed, he's got diversity. He's got solid takedown defense at 82% and that allows him to get loose with his striking. He does a pretty good job being patient and then pouring it on when he sees his opportunity. He's coming off that early knockout win over Thomas Nolan. This event is in China, so obviously there's going to be some favorable matchup for local guys or at least guys in that region. You don't have to actually be from China to probably get a nod from a judge or two. Mahashete's not good. He's not very good. He's way too hittable, especially to have meaningful success in this division. He is tough as hell, though. And he can sling. The UFC gave him Mata, who can be knocked out and won't be a wrestler. But I'm going to pick Mata here. We're going underdog right off the rip. I think Mahashete is just too sloppy. I think he's going to eat too many shots. And the game plan to get hit and then hit back isn't always going to work. Nicholas Mata is also chinny. But Nicholas Mata is going to be the faster, better, more accurate striker in this matchup. And he's a plus 176 underdog. That seems insane to me. Mata's going to be the pick, and I'm going to keep an eye on that line. If that continues to widen, if we somehow get a plus 200, plus 250, Nicholas Mata, I will sprinkle a little bit on that. Right now, conservative Ange. Go back to UFC 309. Conservative Ange avoided the Mickey Gall nonsense, avoided the Karini Silver ridiculous line. Conservative Ange. Tried and true, baby. I am going to watch that Nicholas Mata line because there may be something to be said there. Then we have Long Zhao taking on Quang Lee. 
Long Zhao is a grappler. And we got a bunch of diehard, move forward at all costs grapplers on this card. Long Zhao isn't that extreme of a grappler, but he is a grappler. He's not particularly dangerous. He is very durable. He has a wealth of experience with 35 fights. He carries that composure with him. He doesn't panic if things are not going well. And despite his record, things don't go well for him pretty often. He can be taken down. He can be touched up. He can struggle with guys who have forward pressure. But he typically finds a way to win and does have that wrestle at all cost type approach. He's taking on Quang Lee. Quang Lee is coming off a short notice step off over Chris Gutierrez. He was scheduled to fight on the Contender Series about a month or two after that fight. But he stepped up on a few days notice and actually had a pretty good outing he wasn't afraid he moved forward he threw big he even had a few offensive takedowns style wise he's a striker he's got that muay thai stance he's light on his toes he rolls those shoulders and he likes to plot forward he finds his range with kicks and then he likes to hang on the outside of the pocket this is a tough fight to pick because they're relatively evenly matched. If you use their last performance as the barometer, Quang Lee on short notice against Chris Gutierrez actually looked pretty good. He was, I mean, he was definitely outstruck. That, that wasn't even close. But he still moved forward without fear. He got a couple of offensive takedowns. I think if he does that in this fight, he can have some success. Ultimately, though, I am going to go on the other side. I'm picking Zhao because what didn't go well for Quang was the striking. While he moved forward without fear, his face was absolutely dotted up. And he's going to move forward without fear. And then Zhao is going to lower his level, shoot a takedown, and get this to the ground. So Long Zhao is the pick. Not my most confident pick on this card, though. Then we have, I'm assuming, Loner Kavanaugh taking on Jose Ochoa. Uh, guys, it's Sunday morning. If you went to church today, what I'm going to need from you is a whole lot of grace. Because there's some insane names on this card. And all I can do is pronounce it the best way that my Western accent can pronounce it. That's all I can do. That's it. And if I say Quang instead of Kwong, if I mix up the first name and the last name, it guys, it is what it is. No disrespect meant. The funniest part about all of that, if you look at the names listed out on Tapology and then look at them listed out on the UFC website... They are not the same. Not only are the names spelled completely different, not necessarily this fight, but other fights on this card. Not only are they spelled completely differently, they reverse them. So I don't know which one is correct. I went with Tapology because the UFC's website absolutely sucks. They can't even announce their own fights on time. So I went with Tapology. So again, if you are from that part of the world, if your name has an X in it, I apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong. It just comes out that way this is how i speak and the speech impediment isn't gonna help loner kavanaugh taking on jose ochoa lonier kavanaugh fast pace striker incredible movement good speed and i can't emphasize the speed enough here to the point where watching his highlights and breaking down tape you could honestly convince yourself it's a little bit fast forwarded he's got raw power as well so the combination of super speed and raw power has been working well for him. He doesn't chase knockouts, and he's got enough cardio to fight for a full 15 minutes. He is a genuine prospect, and he's got some real composure as if he were a veteran. He's taking on Jose Ocha. He's a well-rounded guy. He's happy to slug it out or work in some grappling. His takedown defense is solid. He does a great job defending the actual takedowns instead of working in random pitter-patter strikes or looking for submissions that aren't there. He has finishes on the feet. But that has more to do with his pressure and his pace and his volume than it does with raw power. He can be hittable, but he's durable enough to hang. And this should be a really fun fight. Both these guys are very fast and very versatile. This fight could go anywhere and both will be well prepared for anything. The pick is going to be Lonier. Loner, Lanier. I, dude, there's an apostrophe. There's two E's. Guys, again, forgiveness. His speed is the difference. His high-level training will be the difference. Jose's a dog. He's going to move forward. The pressure is going to be there. But if he can't see the shots coming because they're so damn fast, he's going to get absolutely lit up. Lonier is the pick, and I'm pretty high on him here. The little guys don't usually have a ton of finishes, but both of these guys get finishes. So between these two, we might have something really special here. This could be an awesome fight to watch. Let's check out those round lines when we get them, and maybe an under will be a sneaky good play. Remember that whole speech I gave you about the names and how they're switched 
and spelled differently everywhere, this is one of those fights. Kangji Zhu on Tapology is a very different human being on the UFC website. But we got Kangji Zhu taking on Bin Ji. Everything in me wants to say Kangel, Kangel, Kangel Zhu. Very powerful striker. What he lacks in volume, he will make up for in just sheer raw power. He's almost like a coiled snake where he's just ready to throw at any moment, but he waits for the perfect opportunity. He's got solid kickboxing. He does a great job setting up those kicks with his hands. His takedown defense is just okay, but if he is taken down, he never settles. He's constantly looking for a way back up, pushing the head, scooting his hoops. And by hoops, I meant hips. When he throws, he throws with power and is constantly looking for a finish. He's taking on Bin Ji. This guy's a cautious striker who's looking to plot forward and work in takedowns. You're going to see a check hook knockout win to actually get him into the tournament finals, which is what this fight is. But that was more of an anomaly than the norm. He's actually pretty flat-footed on the feet, but he does a good job working submissions on the ground. He's not afraid to chase a finish through submissions or TKO, but that over-aggression can have him losing positions. Bin is the favorite here. Slight favorite, but he is the favorite. And that's likely because he's the much better grappler, but I think the striking gap is far wider than the grappling gap. I think the raw power from Zhu is going to be the difference here. He can either finish Bin early with that power or touch him up, get him to feel it. And then he's going to be scared shooting terrible takedowns from too far. And those are the easier ones to defend. Zhu is the pick. I'm going to keep an eye on the odds here because if he slips to an even bigger dog and it continues to widen, then I'll throw some money on Zhu. But right now, I love, I love the striking and the never settling in on the ground from Kangji Zhu. Then we have Su Young Yu taking on Balgan Janusili. Su Young Yu, nonstop wrestler who will shoot takedowns before the gloves even touch. If he does entertain the striking, it's just a pump a jab or two before diving at legs. He will literally attempt 20 to 30 takedowns per fight. He'll even throw a jab and then just touch your knee to remind you, I'm probably going to shoot a takedown. He can be sloppy, but he is absolutely unrelenting. When he gets to the ground, he's an aggressive grappler who is constantly climbing and working forward for a submission. Buying Janusili is a long, lean guy for the division. He does a decent job using that size. He does a nice job plodding forward and cutting off the cage. He stands pretty tall. People shoot on him very often, but the takedown defense is solid. He's always looking to hurt his opponents with strikes from top, and he's very fast in transitions. And I'm loving the dogs. On these road to the UFC tournament finals, I think there's five of them, I am loving the dogs in these. Young Yu is a very good wrestler, but that's it. He can definitely get himself into trouble with desperate shooting. And while Janusli's long legs make him an easy target to be taken down, it's been like that his entire career. And he does a great job cross-facing, elbowing, uppercutting on the way in. He does a great job making you pay for those shots. He'll even knee you in the face or in the chest while defending. Not while you shoot, but you already have the leg and he's kneeing you there. I can't bet on this fight because it could go either way and... Janusili can just be taken down and held down the whole time. But I'm going to pick the dog here. I'm picking Janusili, which I'm a thousand percent sure is not how you pronounce that. I just think Young Yu is a little too sloppy to get this done. Then we have Kiru Sohata taking on Dong Hoon Choi. Kiru Sohata is like Dalsim from Street Fighter. You know, the long guy who just stretches limbs out. And that's how Kiru Sohata fights. He's long. And it seems like he gets even longer when he throws out those strikes. He bounces on his toes. He cuts the cage off well before planting and then throwing head kicks or body kicks. His takedown defense is solid because he does a good enough job staying long. He will widen the base. You know how Sean Woodson defend takedowns? That's how Kiru Sahata defends takedowns as well. He does a really good job working. He does a really good job staying balanced. He does not have a ton of power, but he's got solid volume and he uses his length well enough to touch you up on the outside and even do some damage. He's taking on Dong Hoon Choi. 
He's a cautious striker with a wide stance and low hands. He can be a bit hittable, but he is tough enough to survive. He works in offensive takedowns well, but he can struggle with control. The takedowns work for him because he is very hesitant on the feet and almost lulls you into comfort. Like, oh, nothing's happening here. We're just staring at each other. And then, boom, he'll shoot a takedown out of absolute nowhere. He's not particularly strong. He's not fast. He's not powerful, but he is tough. He's got cardio, and he can start to take over fights late. This is another road to the UFC tournament final and another underdog pick. You're welcome. Half you dweebs, anytime I pick a bunch of favorite, uh, there's always like, you do, bro picks all favorites. Okay. What happened at UFC Vegas 100? There was 11 fights on that card and 10 of them were favorites that won. Picking dogs versus favorites, who gives a shit? You break down a fight and you pick who you think wins. In this case, happened to pick a bunch of dogs. So look at me. Anybody picking favorites is a nerd. Have some balls. Pick a dog. Anyway, that's how you guys sound. I just don't see why Choi is the favorite, honestly. He's a low-volume striker with an occasional takedown. He bleeds with the slightest bit of contact, and he can be pushed around. You sneeze too hard, and he's got a cut under his eye. I think Kiru's range is going to give Choi a lot of problems, and I think Kiru's ability to do damage everywhere is going to cut him up, bloody him up. And either finish the fight or definitely have the judges seeing the mess that will be his face and then awarding Chikiru the decision. So he's going to be the pick. And I actually threw a quarter of a unit on him at plus 130. Hey, Ange, why only a quarter? You said he should win. He should be the favorite. Because I don't know these freaking people. Look at these names. That's why. That's why. Conservative Ange. I'm going to put four units on a guy that I've never seen before that looks like a video game character. I don't think so. Then we have Ming Shi taking on Zhao Kan Fang. Zhao Kan Fang, the fighter on the right, is a wrestler who will shoot very real takedowns instead of relying on cage control and trips. She uses her takedowns to force fights to the ground and then just pound away. She does a good job maintaining and keeping busy to not get stood up. She follows hips really well. She flows between side control, guard, and other positions. Her submission defense is solid, and overall, she's a very dominant fighter when she can get her game plan going, which is get this fight to the ground. She's taking on Ming Shi. Ming Shi is a forward pressure striker. She is very small for this division at five foot two, and she can struggle with range because she is just so damn small. She is tough. She is aggressive, and that can be successful for her in the past. Her striking isn't clean, but it is heavy and is always there. Her takedown defense against the cage is solid, but in the open mat, it definitely lacks. Her offensive takedowns are also much better off the cage than they are in the middle. This is a very straightforward fight. I am pretty confident here. Fang should get it done. She has a humongous size advantage. She's got a great wrestling advantage, and she should be able to get the takedowns, work on top, and cruise to a win. I am very confident in her, and I think she is safe to parlay. I actually tried to parlay her yesterday. I use bet online. A lot of people ask me, where do you place your bets? I also live in Texas. We, we Texas doesn't have regulated sports betting, so you have to use an offshore book. We use bet online. Bet online, in my opinion, is one of the best offshore books because you're going to get the earliest odds. Like, they have odds for fights all the way out into March of next year. So you're going to get the earliest odds. My issue with Bet Online is they do protect their lines because they're the earliest lines and they don't have other books to monitor and to learn from. They have to use the action on their lines to determine should they go up or down. So they protect their lines. Sometimes when they first open, you'll get limited to how much you can bet and they will limit parlays. I tried to parlay Zhao Kan Fang. That's how confident in her I am. It wouldn't let me. Maybe by the time I'm done filming this video and I go to do it again, I will be able to do it. I, I'm going to have a parlay with her in it. I already know which one. I'm just waiting for the freaking thing to unlock. If you do want to check out that parlay, become a premium member. It's $10. A, it's just a phenomenal way to support us and everything we do and my sleep deprivation from filming these damn videos for you. Two, or B, I forget what I started with. I think I said A. So B, it's the best value in this space. Not even freaking close. Just check the history. Go back to the beginning of this video. Up 11 and last 12 cards. Big edge. Then the featured prelim, at least for now, this fight order is definitely going to change. We have, we're just saying yam. Right? We're saying yam. I'm not getting canceled over trying to pronounce this. No, we're going to do it. Yam Yargle to Mendemineral. No, that wasn't it. Taking on Carlos Hernandez. We'll stick with that one. I can roll my R's. Carlos Hernandez is a grappler with okay striking. 
Striking wise, he's got solid accuracy. He's got deceiving power. He's not the most technically sound guy, but he's got a nice jab with a straight that falls right behind it. He's another one of these guys that has really slick BJJ, but absolute dog shit wrestling, so he can't control if it gets to the ground or not. He will take shots, but they're usually stuffed, and then he ends up working with the upper body and then trying for a trip. He's been known to throw up a Hail Mary submission or two, like flying triangles, and he is coming off that decision loss to Rai Tosura, where he basically was just out grappled. He's taking on Nyam. Nyam is a powerful striker who has a wide base and bombs punches. He uses a very long step and jab to close distance, and then he'll just swing wild. He has no problem with a dirty pocket fight, but he can be hit and doesn't have the best striking defense. He's always moving forward. He's always doing something. He is undefeated with seven stoppages, but he is relatively untested. And for that reason, I'm going Carlos Hernandez. I think Carlos can win this fight. There's a lot to be said about high-level experience. And while he doesn't have a ton of success in the UFC, what he does have is cage time in the biggest promotion on the planet. What he does have is cage time with some notable fighters. I think Yam is talented, but I also think he's going to get frustrated if this fight goes long. And Carlos can take over from there. Carlos is a tough guy. With that being said, no money. Yeah, you can't bet on this fight. No money here. It's always hard to tell how good a young undefeated guy is or what kind of fraud is sitting there waiting. So we're going to leave it alone. Yam might show up looking incredible or he might absolutely shit the bed. Pick-wise, I'm going with Carlos Hernandez. And I do this speech every week. As this space grows, as we continue to dominate this space, and yes, we do. Don't pretend we don't. Some of you love us, and there's some people hate watching this right now being like, I can't stand that beautiful bastard just sitting there looking exactly like Ben Affleck. I hate him. I hate him. And you haven't been able to express that hate because I've been dominating. And the minute I slip up, you guys are going to pop up. Oh, you, we won't fix the scam. Can't do it, though. Been up 11 in the last 12 weeks. Point to all that. As this space grows, people pop up start their own channels, make their own content. And I want to remind people that if you're tracking picks, fine, go for it, doesn't matter. But picks and bets are not the same. Also, picks are not the same. Me saying I think Carlos Hernandez wins this fight and I'm not nearly confident enough to bet on it is very different than the last fight where I said I was 100% sure Zhao Kahn Fang was going to win. Those are not equal picks. Those are not equal picks. And those are things that you should keep in mind when you're listening to breakdowns. Confidence levels matter very much. If you are a premium member, we have the Confident Picks tab or the Confident Picks page where it lists our most confident picks on a card. You're not going to see this motherfucker on there. I'll tell you that much. And if you want 50 bucks, you want to look inside your wallet and then see 50 bucks. Actually, I can't send you physical money. But if you want to look at your bank account and see 50 bucks, go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. Use any one of the affiliate links for the sports book. Bet Openly is not a sports book. All the other ones are. For a sports book, sign up, make a deposit. We'll send you 50 bucks to the tank. It's affiliate marketing, right? They're going to pay me. I'm going to slice off 50 bucks. I'm going to send it right to you. It's that simple. We want picks.com slash bets. Here's a close look. Braggy and safety parlay. Absolutely crushing it. I've hit seven in a row. Four of them were plus money. I don't have a safety parlay for this card yet, but that was because the parlays were locked. On my sports book, those will be unlocked soon and we'll have one up. 6.45 units over the last seven events from one single bet. A 92% ROI from the safety parlay. We're going to ride this success for the rest of the year, but we are on quite the streak as it is. Up 11 of the last 12 cards, 13 units of net profit, a 28% ROI on the last 12 cards. I'm definitely feeling the love on this, so I do got a little swagger. Appreciate you all, all the positive comments on these videos and the other videos, all the support. Obviously, if I'm making money and you're making money, it's pretty easy to love us. So I'll take it while I can. I know how fickle this sport is, though. And if you want to unlock those picks, those bets, and the tools like the data analyzer, we want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. And if you guys get annoyed with these promos, I get it. I get it. But the reality is, we don't do mid cycle ads. You're never going to watch a video of ours where there's an ad in the middle. And if there is, that's because we used some copywritten audio or something and they inserted the ad. So we're not going to load this up with ads. You are going to get an ad from me. Big deal. It is what it is. YouTube pays nothing. There's no money in YouTube. Not one dollar. You don't make shit. We dominate the pick side of MMA YouTube, not like the gossip, news, entertainment side, but the pick side. And the money we make on YouTube, I would be making one dollar an hour for the amount of time we put into this. That's why premium membership is so important. 
It gives us the time and the freedom and the opportunity to do all of this content. So if you want to become a premium member for the insane value, that is why we designed it. If you want to become a premium member just to support us, well, that would be appreciated as well. We want picks.com, click become a member. One of the tools included is the data analyzer. It has been coded from scratch, literally custom code. This is not a tool that exists in the wild. We built it. It has everything you could ever need in one single spot. If the entire website was only this and nothing else, $10 would still be insane value. And here's the address if you want to send something. UFC 310s in a couple of weeks. We will be filming a vlog. I filmed the vlog yesterday for UFC 309. We opened a couple of letters. If you want to send a letter, we will read it. If you want to send food, if it's, I mean, I'm probably not going to eat it. But if you want to send something, send something. You have a small business, a large business, you want to promote something, we want picks, P.O. Box 406 in Prosper, Texas, 75078. Opening up the UFC China main card, we have Volkan Ozdemir taking on Carlos Ulberg. This is an interesting fight. That when I saw it, boom, I knew exactly who was going to win. And then I started to type up my notes, the ones that I'm looking at right now, and I got less and less and less confident. We got Vulcan Ozdemir, forward pressure striker, legit power, good volume. He throws his hands hard. He throws them often. He does have a miserable takedown accuracy at 33%, and that can be an issue for him because if he is losing the striking exchanges, his chin cannot always keep him in the fight, and neither can the wrestling. He is 7-7 seven and seven in the UFC with a mixed bag of competition, but one thing is for sure, and it's that all of his losses are quality. He has lost to former world champions, Yuri Prohoshka, Daniel Cormier, and Kalaev. He's coming off that KO win over Johnny Walker. And if you can knock out Johnny Walker, you too can be a champion. He's taking on Carlos Ulberg. This guy is a world-class kickboxer. He transitioned to MMA a little while ago. Very big guy, incredible footwork. I mean, incredibly good looking. It's insane. Look at this guy. Dude, he's 6'4". He's 6'4 with that skin tone, that facial hair, and that hairline. This is insane. He's probably the best looking guy in the UFC right now. No Diddy. And, and honestly, even if there was some Diddy, who gives a shit? As, as a handsome myself, I can recognize other handsomes. Now, if I was ugly, this would just be jealousy. But thank God I'm handsome. So now it's just like, what's up, bro? Boom. If we saw each other, you know how people who drive Jeeps have that stupid-ass Jeep wave? No offense. That's like us handsomes. If we saw each other, we'd spot each other, both tall as shit. That wasn't sarcasm. We would spot each other and just be like, I got you, dog. Yeah, we're the best-looking guys here. It is what it is. He's a world-class kickboxer. I am not. Both gorgeous, but different skill sets. He's a big guy, incredible footwork, great range management. His striking differential is a very impressive almost 8-3. to three. He has both a 75% takedown accuracy and defense. His only MMA loss was a knockout to Kennedy and Chuck in a fight that he was dominating until he got clipped. He is coming off that KO win over Alonzo Menafield, where that was less Carlos and more Alonzo just running forward recklessly and getting clipped. And when I saw this, I mentioned my instant reaction was, boom, Carlos Ulberg safety parlay. I was wildly confident. But then the more I look at it, the more I'm respecting Vulcan and his skill set. He has a ton of high-level fights. It's ridiculous. If you look at who this guy has fought, it is absolutely insane. He might be the only guy to not fight for a title that has fought as many world champions or former world champions as he has. It is insane. And while you can say his chin is questionable, that's what I had in my head. Ah, Vulcan gets knocked out easy. I had to go look. He hasn't been knocked out since Jiri Prohoshka in 2020. And then even before that, a very long period before he was knocked out again. I am still going to pick Ulberg here. I'm going to stick with my gut. But the confidence took a little bit of a hit. The takedown defense, if that holds up, then this is going to be an easy cakewalk for Carlos Ulberg. He is the much, much better striker. But if Vulcan can threaten the takedowns, get Carlos to the cage, then step off, let his hands go, do it again, and get him guessing, he could catch him the same way Kennedy did Carlos Ulberg is going to be the pick, but I'm not as insanely confident as I was on the initial look. Then we have Kong Wang taking on Gabriela Fernandez. Kong Wang, professional kickboxer. She made the leap into MMA. And it doesn't take a whole lot of research when you're doing your tape study to see that she actually beat the current champion, Valentina Shevchenko, in a kickboxing fight. And she fights exactly how you would expect a decorated high-level kickboxer to fight. Incredible striking, good power, and speed. She can defend takedowns. At least, it looks like she can. She hasn't fought a nonstop wrestler yet, so she is relatively untested in that department. She's coming off that humongous knockout win over Victoria Leonardo. And not humongous because Victoria is so good, but humongous because she showed up with a joker mask, said, welcome to the UFC, boom. 
knocked her out bad. And that power at this weight class is impressive. She's taking on Gabriela Fernandez, also a pretty powerful striker. She's very big, she's strong, she's fast, and she's technical. She has very fluid striking and solid BJJ as well. Her takedown defense is just okay. It is mostly her just being big and strong and less about her using the correct techniques. She's got solid BJJ and can work well off her back, but she does end up hanging out too long and giving up control time. She can offensively grapple as well. We saw a bit of that in her last fight. She's coming off that close win over Carly Judice where she had two takedowns. There's definitely some questions about Wang's takedown defense because it really hasn't been tested. But I don't think Gabriella is going to be the one to test it. Wang should absolutely smoke her here. The power is nuts. And after she lands a few shots, Gabriella is going to be taking desperate attempts at takedowns. Desperate, too far away, shitty shots. Because she's going to feel the power and say, oh boy, I need out of here. And then she'll probably get finished. Wang's going to be the pick. I'm very confident on her. One of my most confident picks on this card. Then we have Kanan Song taking on Muslim Salikov. Kanan Song's a guy that's always going to be fun and always going to be frustrating because he may have the lowest fight IQ in the history of this sport. He is a powerful striker. His wrestling sucks. He's one punch power. He doesn't have the cleanest technique. He can beat you with that power. He can drop you. He can knock you out. It is there and it is very real. But you can beat him with pressure and control. Don't give him space, though, because he will throw heavy and he will touch you up. His takedown defense can fail him, but he remains composed. He continues to work off his back, try to get to his feet where he is most comfortable. He hits hard. He has knockdowns in more than half his fights, but the low fight IQ is a problem. He's essentially one punch or bust at this point. He's coming up with a decision win over Ricky Glenn. With a flack, the lack of fight IQ was on full display. Had that dude almost knocked out, and then said, eh, let me hug him. Had him almost knocked out. I think I should shoot a takedown. It's insane. It's insane. He's taking on Muslim Salkov. Solid striker who hits very hard himself. He's got good wrestling in his back pocket if he needs it. He holds nothing back. Almost every single strike that he throws is a significant strike. He's got really good takedown defense, solid takedown offense, and great striking. He's coming off that early KO loss to Randy Brown to make it a two-fight skid. He's also old. 40. Old and gross. 40-year-olds are gross, dude. Kanan Song hits like a truck, but has no killer instinct, horrific fight IQ, so even if he gets Salikov in trouble, I'm sure he'll do some dumb shit and let Salikov work his way back into the fight. When he had Ian Gary almost knocked out cold, he said, hey, let me let me hold him against the cage. Instead of throwing three more punches and winning this, let me hold him against the cage. Salikov's old as hell, but he's not stupid. So he is going to be the pick. Hopefully he wrestles and doesn't play that in and out game. But Salikov has to be the pick. When you're fighting an idiot, it is what it is. And I'm not, sorry, Kanan, I'm like, and you may be a neurophysicist in real life, but inside that cage, your decision-making skills are piss poor. Then we have Ming Yang Zhang taking on Ozzy Diaz. Ozzy Diaz not only has a cool name, but he's also really big at six foot four. He's the former LFA champion of the world. He's a striker who's light on his feet. He likes to use movement really well. He's got some grappling, but by no means is he a grappler. He can find finishes in the clinch or at distance. He's creative with his striking and he is very tough, but he can also be hit and he is a bit chinny. He is a very tall six foot four, but isn't the thickest guy in the world. He's kind of skinny. In fact, he fought a good chunk of his career at middleweight. He's taking on Ming Zhang Nope, Ming Yang Zhang. I was right there. God damn it. There's, there's only three fights left and I got through this whole thing without a giant blunder of a name. I was right there. Ming Yang Zhang, dangerous, but mostly ground and pound dangerous. He does have some raw power in his strikes. We actually saw a little bit of that in the last fight, but he's typically looking to mix it up on the feet and then quickly close the distance and work these fights to the ground where he has fantastic pressure. He has an excellent record with a 100% finish rate, split between knockouts and submissions, but 90% of those submissions or the TKOs were all on the ground. He can be sloppy on the feet, but he is very tough and will continue moving forward. He's coming off that KO win over Brinson Hibero. This should be a really fun fight. It's definitely going to end by finish. Both guys are finishers and not afraid to engage. I think Ozzy's just a little too chinny to fully hang with Zhang, and even if he has some success... Zhang is the far superior grappler. So Zhang is going to be the pick here. You're probably safe to try to find a little extra juice like Zhang inside the distance. So Zhang's going to be the pick. I don't typically love prop bets like that, but I don't see this fight going to the distance. 
Then we have our co-main event of the evening. Former title challenger, Yan Zhanan, taking on Tabitha Ricci. We have, it's actually Zhao Nan Yan. Here's another fight. Check Tapology. They have it spelled one way. Check UFC website. It's completely flipped. So go on Tapology route. Tapology says Zhao Nan Yan. Very good boxer. Very well-timed strike. She's got good, clean technique and does not shy away from a dirty fight she is willing to bang. Outside of her three UFC losses, which were to a former champion, a top five fighter, and the current champion, she's had a solid run in the UFC. We've seen her showcase power. We've seen the technical striking. We've seen the grappling improvements. She's coming off that title loss to Wei Li Zhang, where she was taken down six times, but she did have three of her own. She's taken on Tabitha Ricci. Tabitha Ricci is a very good grappler who takes her time and settles into positions before looking for submissions. She's very heavy on top. She's got good pressure and control. She will ground and pound while on top, and that creates scrambles, and it opens her opponents up for submissions. Her striking is improving, but it's not great. Neither are her takedowns, which is why she has to rely on cage control so often. She's coming off the decision win over Angela Hill, where her forward pressure and cardio were absolutely insane. And Tabitha Ricci might have the best cardio pace and pressure in this division. She has an insane gas tank. She continues to move forward at all costs. The problem is, while she spends all of that time working on her cardio, she doesn't spend enough time working on the skills. She doesn't spend enough time working on the wrestling. The striking is just okay. Her BJJ is very, very good. But without the actual threat of a takedown, she can't use the BJJ. And her striking is just hollow pressure. The bookies seem to agree with that take because Zhao... Zhao Nan Yan, Yan, damn it, is a two to one favorite here. Yan is going to be the pick. Tabitha's pressure can obviously win her around, win her a couple of rounds. So the over two and a half, the plus three and a half, good as gold. Probably the best bets on this card. But Yan is going to be the pick. And that takes us to the main event of the evening. We have Pyotr Yan just flexing for his picture. Look at him trying, try, look at the face and then look at the body. He's flexing his ass off, but pretending he's not. Just like, take it. Take the picture. Piotr Jan, former world champion, taking on Divison Figueredo. Piotr Jan is the former bantamweight champion of the world. Phenomenal striker. Great takedown defense. Surprisingly solid takedown offense as well. He's a nightmare for a lot of people because of how dangerous his striking is, how underrated his offensive wrestling can be. He plots forward. He's got that Muay Thai guard. He blasts away with power and accuracy. He averages almost two takedowns per fight. He has a solid 85% takedown defense. And he's coming off that win over Song Yedong, where he had a couple of takedowns and some very clean striking. He's taking on Divas and Figueredo. He's the former flyweight champion of the world. He's undefeated in his new weight class here. And since moving up to bantamweight, we have seen cardio improvements. We have seen a higher focus on the wrestling. He actually has seven takedowns in his last three fights, and that's more than his last seven fights combined. He's a well-rounded guy who is dangerous everywhere. He has power in his hands, well-timed takedown. He is a BJJ black belt, and he's got a little bit of dog in him. He's coming off that decision win over Cheeto Vera where he dropped him and took him down twice. Figgy did the impossible. He knocked down Cheeto Vera, the very first recorded knockdown of Cheeto's career. And while you can argue Cheeto was a little off balance, fell down, the reality is that Figgy did very well on the feet and on the ground against Cheeto, who is a division staple. This is a tough fight to pick because Piotr has great takedown defense and great striking. But Figgy's takedowns have looked better than ever, and 135 pounds seem to be suiting him very well. Ultimately, I am going to pick Jan because I think he's just going to be the better striker. He should be the bigger guy here. And his takedown defense is very good. With five rounds to work, Pyotr Jan, even if he gives up a few takedowns early, can start to take over later. Divison's cardio has looked improved, but that's looked improved in a couple of three-round fights. We're going to see what it looks like in five. Pyotr Jan is going to be the pick. I don't know if I'm going to bet on this one. I just have a weird feeling that Figgy is like on an absolute tear right now, so we're going to find out. But guys, that is the breakdown. I just broke down the entire UFC China fight card with like two blunders on three hours sleep. You're welcome. You know how you want to thank me? Becoming a premium member. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. Data analyzer, literally the greatest research tool ever made in this space. I have a whole video on the channel. Just search it. Breaking down entire thing, what you can do with it, how it all works, how you can see the tape study, watch the fights, look for future events, use the stackable filters and all of that. 
Premium membership is also going to give access to other tools like the line movement tracker, opening odds, current odds, win probability, line movement for every fighter on every card. The Prop Hunter, a curated set of data specifically designed to help you find prop bets. The DraftKings Optimizer, this will be preloaded with DraftKings ownership projections, the literal best DraftKings ownership projections. And then it'll build lineups for you that you can use to compete with other people. You're also going to have access to Artem, just the Kiwi breaking down fights for you. But not just UFC fights, regional shows as well. And I guarantee Artem's road to the UFC tournament final insight is going to be really, really pretty, pretty, pretty good. And then an artificial intelligence breaking, breaking down fights solely off of historical data. And finally, if you want 50 bucks, we'll give it to you. We want picks.com slash bets. You sign up, you make a deposit. We send you 50 bucks as a thank you. Guys, I appreciate every last one of you. This year is winding down, but I promise you, we are not. Every single Sunday, you will get a video like this breaking down the next card. I thank you all very, 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 very insanely very much for everything. See you in the next one.